But an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. Good morning and welcome to Beeson Divinity School's weekly service of worship. I especially want to thank you who are visiting from Sanford's campus or from the Birmingham community or beyond. Uh, those of you who are worshiping with us in person or online, we're so glad you're here, you are welcome. Each week, we gather as a community of faith and learning to worship our triune God in spirit and in truth. We gather around God's word every week, asking the Lord Jesus that we may hear his gospel preached to us once again. Worship of God is central to the Christian life as it is to the life together that we share here at Beeson. So I want to begin by thanking the women who are helping lead us in this time of worship. Those of, us, those of you who are sitting behind me, thank you for blessing us with your ministry. There's one change in your order of worship. Emily Knight was supposed to be here this morning to read scripture, but she is under the weather. So we're grateful to have Miranda Cox uh, fill in for her this morning. Thank you, Miranda. Today we will continue our series on the life of Jesus by hearing a sermon from our sister and Beeson alumna, Reverend Connie Hapel. You can read Connie's bio on the back of your order of worship. However, there was something that she did not include in her bio that I thought was of special interest to us here at Beeson. And that is, she was the James Earl Massey Student Preaching Award when she was a student. And so, Connie, I'm going to give away how long ago that was. She preached, the last time she preached in Hodges Chapel was in April 2006. And she preached from Luke's Gospel then on the life of Jesus, in particular at the end in which Jesus met two of his disciples on the road to Emmaus. It was a sermon titled, Alas, He is Here, and we played this on the Beeson podcast a number of years ago, so if you go to our website, I'm sure you can hear it. So it's such a wonderful opportunity to have Connie back almost 17 years later to preach again on the life of Jesus, this time from the Gospel of Matthew, a sermon called Remember. Following the service today, she'll be speaking with the women of Beeson about her ministry. And so uh, to the women, even if you didn't register, you are welcome to come, grab your lunch in S111, and then head over to North 101. Connie, we are praying for you this morning, and all we ask is what you did 17 years ago, and that is to give us Jesus. Now as we focus our minds and hearts on God and move into this time of worship, I want to invite you to stand if you are able to join me in the call to worship by responding in the bold. In the day of my trouble, I seek the Lord. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. Let us pray. Lord, you have made us for yourself, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. Therefore, calm our restless hearts with the knowledge that we belong to you. Comfort us with the gospel of Jesus Christ once again. Drive away all distractions and enable us to worship you this morning. You are great, Lord, and highly to be praised. May your name be praised in this place. Amen. I love this place. When I was a student here, back in the Pleistocene era, or toward the beginning of the history of Beeson, uh, sometimes between the stress and anxiety of classes and tests, I would come into this chapel and trace the life of our Lord around these murals to 
look up at the reformers, the apostles, uh, there's some martyrs up there, and then, of course, there's our Lord Jesus up there in that dome, spreading out his arms, surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, embracing you and me and all of God's world. What a privilege it was to be part of this community. And what a great honor it is to be with you all today. Please join me in prayer. Lord, this word is your word. Even now, Lord, wherever we find our hearts and our minds, Lord, may we bring honor and glory. Speak to us, Lord. Amen. Now, the place I come from, though, today is a different place from Beeson. I come to you from the local church where there are weekly sermons to be preached, pastoral care to be cared for, denominational duties, to be attended to, elder meetings to be moderated. I come to you from a faithful congregation that is somewhat smaller than she used to be. She has launched many faithful disciples of our Lord Jesus out into the world, and now she is in the struggle to maintain the grandeur of what she has built. You may think to yourself, well, she's from the PCUSA. They are in the liberal mainline, and that is for sure. But you all know as well that we are not the only ones who are struggling these days. I would say that from where I stand right now in my everyday life, The church is in a wilderness of sorts. Times have changed. The church is not central to people's daily life as she used to be. People are finding other ways to fill the voids in their lives. If you want peace of mind, go see a therapist or maybe get an app on your phone. If you, uh, your, your children, There are plenty of activities and achievements available to keep them busy 24-7. And weddings, there are now venues and officiants to handle such things. Those who measure such things say that people are not as interested in the church as they used to be or in Jesus Christ our Lord, those familiar signposts of success are harder to come by. There are churches and ministries that are thriving in our country in this time. And there are more than I wish who are simply hanging on and surviving. The church is in what some would call a liminal space. The past is where it always is. It's squarely behind us. But the future is being revealed little by little. I don't think we're getting to see too far into the future. As a minister in a congregation, the greatest temptation that I see congregations facing these days is the temptation to wish for the glory days to return as they were and to expect that their leadership will bring those glory days back. It's a challenge. But I believe that God is doing a new thing in this wilderness. And our greatest test as leaders of Christ church is to remember who we are. We are, and you are, children of God. You are beloved of the Savior. You are indwelt by God's Holy Spirit. You are purveyors of God's holy word, and you are sent on God's mission into God's world. So today, we follow Jesus. He comes 
up from the waters of baptism where his identity has been affirmed. And the same spirit that descended as a dove drives him out into the wilderness for his baptismal identity to be challenged. And then, of course, we follow him from there on out into the world as a man on a mission. But Matthew wants you to know something about Jesus, and you know this already. Jesus was, was not just any teacher. He didn't just start any movement, but every single thing about him, from his genealogy to his birth to the events of his baptism, testify that he is none other than God's son, the one who is sent to redeem beloved Israel. And Matthew and his contemporaries want you to understand this. You know, they witnessed the resurrection. But first, Jesus must pass the test that God's beloved child Israel could not seem to pass. So the Holy Spirit drives Jesus out into the desolate Judean wilderness. Jesus prepares for the test with a fast, 40 days, 40 nights, nothing to eat, no comfort, no company, nothing much to look at but that desert scape. Nothing to do but survive the tricks the body and the mind and even the human spirit will play upon us when we are depleted and we are deprived. <laughs> I ask the question and I know the answer. Have you ever been in this sort of wilderness yourself where there seems to be no help, maybe no hope, anxiety? and fear may commandeer your heart and your mind. We know that wilderness times come in many shapes and sizes and forms, and really the only way you know you are in one is to look around for those props you usually reach out for to save yourself and come up empty-handed. Now, I wonder about Jesus, fully human. What did he feel during his wilderness time? Did he feel depressed, anxious, afraid? I wonder if he was able to experience the Father's love when all comfort was removed from him. And I wonder what he thought about. Did he worry about his friends and family? Possibly, probably. Did he ponder Israel's wilderness wanderings, those 40 years in the desert? Did he think about the words of the prophets and chew on what was said about the Messiah who was to come, the king? Do you think he meditated on the suffering servant? You think he took a spin by Genesis 22? and wondered if the Lord would provide a lamb. Or Psalm 22, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I don't know. But what we do know is that Jesus' wilderness had a purpose. This one and every other one he was to endure had a purpose. The author of Hebrews tells us that Jesus is our great high priest, because he's able to sympathize with us in our weakness. Because he's been tested and tried in every way, just as we are, but he did not sin. So, along comes the evil one. He saunters up and he says to Jesus, if you are the Son of God, if you are who you believe yourself to be, if you are, change these stones into bread. Satan knows who Jesus is. Their relationship is almost as old as time. But Jesus himself at this point may not be so certain. If you are, the tempter says, feed your hungry self or stir up some of that miraculous manna stuff. 
We know this voice, don't we? The seed of doubt was planted with Jesus about his identity, and it is planted sometimes with us. If you are a good pastor, if you are a capable leader, if you are devoted to your calling, then God will feed you what you deeply desire. Maybe a healthy, thriving church with a generous donor base or a publication, or a podcast, or some kind of fun digital platform. If you are, maybe you will have the perfect family and children who fall in line and do exactly what you want. If you are faithful to your calling, if God loves you, you're not going to go hungry. The ifs are painful, and they are plentiful when we are exhausted and at our wit's end. We are tempted to feed ourselves in whatever way possible to make the pain go away. But the word Jesus spoke from the beginning, the word he studied all his life, comes forth as his sure defense, and he remembers He remembers Israel and their 40 years where they were tested and where they were humbled to see if they would keep God's commands. God made them hungry and fed them with manna. Why? To teach them that human beings do not live by bread alone, but by every single word that comes forth from the mouth of the Lord. Now... The word has come to Jesus, and he's passed test number one, but he's still hungry. And I imagine he's feeling pretty weak by then, and I imagine that Satan took him by the hand and said, let me take you to the top of the temple, to the pinnacle. He says, you know, you've thrown scripture at me, but I know scripture too. If you are the Son of God, just throw yourself down, for surely as it is written, the Lord will send those angels and they'll pick you up and you won't even stub your toe. Jesus proved the vitality of God's Word. Prove your trust in God's Word. Do something sensational. Surely the Father loves you. Surely the Father will not allow harm to come to you. Isn't that love? Always protects, always provides no pain, no suffering, no anxiety. Prove God's love for you, Jesus, before you go out there and make a darn fool of yourself. This was a hard test for Jesus. He knew who he thought he was. He experienced his life and his baptism. He knew the stories. He knew he was called the beloved, but, and, but, and he also knew that Satan is so capable of distorting the word of God. Jesus knew that testing God is not the same thing as trusting God. We've seen scripture misused and manipulated for evil purposes and and causing a lot of unholy drama and divisiveness in our church. The temptation to test God's presence with us and for us is always with us, especially when we are in the wilderness. This is why the classes you have in Bible and theology and hermeneutics and the rest are so very important because Satan has known Scripture a lot longer than you have, and he's eager to use it against you. So Jesus weighs Scripture versus Scripture and says, do not, do not put the Lord your God to the test like you did back in the wilderness at Massa. So, of course, Satan's not finished. we got to have the third test. Weak Jesus is taken by the hand, by the evil one, and taken to the top of some mountain where 
from where one can see all of the kingdoms of the world. And he says, look at this world God created, my world. Look at humanity. Aren't they amazing, industrious, creative, able to do almost anything, and they're free to do good or not? Jesus, why suffer for these? Why bother to redeem these? When I offer you the easy way, we all know what you want. You want the nations to come and bow before you. That is your end game. Bow down and worship me, and all of this I will give to you. Wow. Satan offers Jesus a shortcut. If Jesus takes the deal, he won't have to endure the various Many very real pains of being human and betrayed and denied and flogged and crucified and hung out to dry. He will not have to face the great enemy, death. This temptation for Jesus is real. And we know that temptation too, don't we? We know the temptation of the shortcut. We all want more, better, faster. We want to move forward, not backwards. We want ministries that are fruitful and successful, not failing. We have people and maybe pulpits, but those people, they are so demanding and so dysfunctional. And boy, we are tempted to form them in our own image. We are tempted to fix them with the latest spiritual band-aid. We are definitely tempted to abandon them for greener pastures. That's for sure. For those of us who are called to lead others in the downward way of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, the temptation to take the shortcut comes to us when we are vulnerable tired, exhausted, and extinguished, just like it did for Jesus. But you know, here's what I wonder. I wonder what Jesus saw when Satan took him up to that mountain pinnacle. What do you reckon he saw from up there? Do you think he saw himself, the bread of life, blessed, broken, and given for the world? Do you think that from that place he could see Gethsemane and Golgotha? Maybe he could see Mary and Martha. Maybe he could see the lost sheep of Israel who he came to save. Maybe he could even look out into the future and see you and me. I wonder what Jesus saw, and I wonder if it was love that kept Jesus from taking the shortcut. He says, not for the first time and not for the last, get out of here, Satan, you beat it. I have God's word and I will not forget. You shall worship the Lord your God and God alone shall you serve. For the rest of Jesus' life and ministry, he will have to say no to temptation and yes to obedience. The angels come and they restore him to health. And when the time is right, he launches himself out into public ministry. He goes about as far in Israel from Jerusalem, the center of power and prestige, as he can get, and he goes straight to his humble homeland in Galilee. Now, Matthew, who you know, never misses an opportunity to tie the old covenant together with the new covenant, lets us know that this fulfills, again, probably, a a prophecy of Isaiah. Those lands of Zebulon and Naphtali, the first to be taken 
into captivity, will be the first to see the Savior. The people living in darkness have seen a great, great light. Jesus begins his ministry not in the mainstream, but definitely on the margins. He brings to the north the message that the Baptist brought to the south. Repent, turn around, change your ways. God is doing a new thing. The kingdom is here, it's near. This is the same word that Jesus spoke to his first four followers, those four fishermen who were tending their nets by the sea. And they, they dropped their nets. They left everything, and they followed Jesus, trusting that he would do as he promised and change them from fishers of fish to be fishers of people. This, my friends, is the same word that brought you here to Beeson. You have turned from something and found yourself here. You have left and you have followed. And your tests and mine are not all that much unlike those of Jesus' first followers. Who among you is the greatest? Jesus, this storm is going to kill us. There is not enough food. I just won't believe unless I see, unless I have a sign. Jesus, well, I don't hang out with that branch of his family. Most of you know the movie The Lion King. It came out in the 90s, Walt Disney. It's about the lion cub Simba, who, uh, who by a turn of events, his father Mufasa is killed by a wildebeest stampede. And the, the stampede was actually organ, orchestrated by Simba's evil Uncle Scar. And Uncle Scar tells little Simba that it is all his fault that his father has died, and Simba hangs his head in, in shame, and he leaves his homeland and goes and makes a life elsewhere. But sometime later, the baboon Rafiki, who was present at Simba's birth, he knew who Simba was. He was to be the king of the jungle. Well, he finds Simba, and he takes him to a body of water, and he encourages him to look over at his own reflection. And at first, Simba is startled because he's all grown up. But Rafiki encourages him, look again. And when he does, he sees his father, Mufasa. And Mufasa says, you know the line, Simba, I can't quite do it. Remember who you are. That was God's word for Israel, wasn't it? Throughout the Old Testament, do not forget your identity. Don't forget your inheritance. Remember who you are and to whom you belong. It is my word for you today. Remember who you are. Remember why you're here. Remember who your Lord is, because I'm telling you, in this life, we face trials, we face temptations, we face tests, and it's not just the devil we got to deal with. It's our own sinful nature. We are vulnerable, we are weak, and we are easily exploited. One of the great, beautiful privileges I had while I was here at Beeson was that I got to study John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion with Dean Timothy George. Oh, that was such a great time. It was hard, too. <laughs> Dean George doesn't play around. Um, but, you know, anyway, the, the Institutes begin with these words, and they're really essential for understanding the whole of John Calvin's writings. But I'm going to read them to you. 
nearly all the wisdom we possess, that is to say true and sound wisdom, consists of two parts, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourselves. Calvin insists that we can't really know ourselves unless we consider ourselves in relation to God, and we can't really know God unless we understand some things about ourselves. It is looking at ourselves in light of God's goodness and God's holiness and God's splendor and beauty and grace and all that, that we begin to understand our own ignorance and our vanity and our weakness. And yes, he uses the word, I'm Presbyterian, depravity. (laughs) Our journey in ministry is always one of self-discovery alongside God-discovery. And we walk alongside hurting people who are also in discovery mode. Nevertheless, today, this day, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. God is still bringing together the beloved community of those who devote themselves to following our Lord Jesus Christ, to loving God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and loving their neighbor. The devil, always, always in the details. Sin will trip us up. But Jesus is on our side. He is not just our Lord. He is our Savior over and over and over again. Jesus was victorious over sin and over the devil and over the great enemy, death. With with Jesus at our side, the wilderness in which we find ourselves today, and if you're not there, you'll be out of here and you'll be out in it soon can be one of the most creative, spirit-filled, transformational, life-changing places to be. The changes that are going on in our nation right now, the trials that the church is enduring, bring alongside them new opportunities for the inbreaking of God's kingdom. And Jesus Christ is still stoking our very holy dreams for the new thing that God is doing in our time. So remember who you are, beloved of God, purveyors of the hope we have in Jesus Christ. Filled with the Holy Spirit, you are gifted and you are called to go out into the world to serve. You are, you are more valuable than you can know. And the callings ahead of you may be more difficult than you can imagine. Because I believe that God is doing a new thing in our day. So go feed, go fish, Go scatter those gospel seeds everywhere you go and trust the Lord with the results. It's not about you. It's about throwing out the seed, isn't it? Don't lose heart. Don't be afraid. Don't give up. The Lord is near. Jesus came as light in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it nor has the darkness understood it. And you, you and me, and those broken people we serve are charged with bearing that Christ light out into God's beloved world. Alleluia and amen. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, grant us courage for the facing of our time. Strengthen each of these students with what they need for the journey you have ahead of them. In our Lord and Savior's precious name we pray. Amen.